The upshot of that story for you that God showed you that is what? God lets you hear secrets if you're willing to hear and be humble. Some of us, we hear God, but we only hear out of the lens we're allowing him to speak. Mm -hmm. So can we handle honest conversation with God? And God goes, look, you know, I want you to know this. There's something that's going to happen to your mom. And that, that to me was assuring that God knows my future. He knows my destiny. We're all being humbled by God. And that's what's real, man. Life is not in our control. Control is an illusion. Your life is like a vapor, man. But that's why we are here, the microsecond we have in history, to actually bring impact, make a change, do as much kingdom as we can here while we're here, and and lay up an inheritance for generations, lay up a legacy for generations. Before we get started, I wanted to give a shout out to our sponsor, Proper Creative. They help me with our brand content and, of course, making our swag. They're the ones that ship it out to us. That's Proper Creative, and they work with any type of business, whether you're a big corporation or a small business or even running it out of your house. They will work with you, and they will help you and relieve a ton of liability and work from your shoulders. That's Proper Creative. You can follow them on Instagram, P-R-O-P-R, or you can go to their website at P-R-O-P-R. R-O-P-R-L-L-C.com. Let Proper Creative help you build your brand and sell direct to consumer, regardless of the size of your business. Proper Creative is definitely a good choice. Welcome to another week of Level Up with Matt Rogers. I am your host, and with me as always, my man Eli Adelman on the ones and twos. Yes, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Engineer, producer, you do it all. I appreciate you. Getting after it today. People don't see what you do behind the scenes. I do. I appreciate all that you do. You're the man. Dude, this morning is a little extra crazy, but... That means okay. it's going to be a little extra good. <laughs> that's right. Because our guest today um, is supernatural and powerful in every sense of the word let me let me preface it with this for all of our listeners i've seen god do too many supernatural things for me to believe anything other than god wants to do supernatural things i mean we were created by a supernatural god we are supernatural beings like we're a spirit first in this body so you have people on this earth that believe in the supernatural. You have people that, you know, go towards the dark side, as I would call it, and go towards like mediums and psychics and, uh, you know, haunted houses and stuff like that, uh, which I don't do and which I treat, teach my kids not to do. And then you have, uh, you know, sons of the light, uh, daughters of the light, daughters and sons of the kings that go towards the light and they are shining uh, supernatural things and they go towards the Holy Spirit. And it was so important, you know, Jesus mentioned it all the time, you know, so much so that Jesus said to the disciples, it's good that I go out of here and get out of here so that the Holy Spirit can come. So this is my friend and he operates in the supernatural like uh, not too many people I've ever seen. I would say that he has a lifestyle of the supernatural. He has a very broad ministry uh, from planting churches to speaking in Huge stadiums, just to name drop a couple people that he rolls with. He was, um, I would say, and I'll have him correct me, like, you know, brought up uh, under Randy Clark, um, speaks with, you know, Cheon, Todd White, Cindy and Mike Jacobs, Jermaine Nelson, Dan Moeller, some of my favorite speakers. And, and, and this guy is one of, uh, I would consider him a very close friend. He is a, a man that walks a supernatural lifestyle and is also a seer, Eli. Do you know what a seer is? Enlighten me. I'm going to, he's going to enlighten you. He is a seer. And we're going to talk about that. My man, Jamie Galloway is here. What's up, Mr. Rogers? What's going on, man? Uh, you know how we do on Level Up. I'm glad I can finally get you. You're a traveling man. You are in Huntsville, right? Yeah, I'm in Alabama. I've been in uh, probably four cities in the last, four states in the last three, uh, in the last month. So and I'm always... I'm always somewhere, but I'm here down in Alabama right now, Huntsville, Alabama. See, and I think this is a, another reason why you and I are such good friends, because we are men in love with Jesus, walking a supernatural life, but we still live life. Like, we have wives, we have kids, we have businesses that we want. Like, you're traveling 
for you and your dad have a very successful pizza business, right? Yeah. I'm, so I'm part of my father's company, uh, Papo's Pizzeria and Brew Pub. And um, we, you know, it's it's a uh, very large pizza operation. We've got a craft beer, craft pizza. It's the real thing. And so uh, I've jumped on board to be a part of that, man. And it's fun, you know, and because uh, I believe really in these days, um, people are, you know, making decisions that, to do one specific thing. And I think God's kind of widening the lane and he's saying, hey, there's multiple avenues to go down multiple streams. And so uh, I'm jumping on board with my family. And it's, it's an exciting thing. I've been in ministry for 20 something years and active vocational ministry and did that. And I love that. And you and I have shared so much time together going out, feeding the poor, feeding oh, yeah. the homeless. And, um, you know, and that's my heartbeat. And so, uh, but Paul was a tent maker and, you know, and we're in a day, I believe an age where we need to really grab that revelation. Uh, Paul is a tent maker. He's an apostle. Yeah. There's donations given to him. He has the Corinthian church lay up a donation, but Paul says, I don't want to create a further burden on you. And he goes mm -hmm. and he, and he creates his own business. And I believe Paul, just like he was an apostle and an excellent one, he probably had a bang in tent business. I mean, he probably had a <laughs> right. really, really top notch tent business. And, uh, you know, that's the age we're living in, you know, kingdom and business together. And so, you know, Jesus, when he heard the father and the father spoke, he said, I must be about my father's business. He didn't say I've, I got to be about my father's ministry. And so it's a it's a fascinating thing, but I'm just kind of wrapping my mind around it and enjoying the journey. I like it. I think it it, it takes down it, it disarms so many things, at least when I go and I speak at different churches and stuff that God has blessed my wife and I with successful businesses outside of ministry. So when yeah. I go to minister to people like I know you do, I'm not there for a love offering. I'm not there because I need people to sow into my ministry. I'm there to truly give and just host the king and watch the Holy Spirit do his thing. And it, it it's very em empowering and freeing in a lot of ways to where, look, at you can almost say, like, I'm coming to your church. I'm going to minister at your four services, and I'm going to bless your church. Don't even take an offering for yes. me. Like, how cool is that? Because God's going to bless my tent business outside so yeah. I can come to you with no strings attached. Yes, sir. That's it, man. I mean, we've got, you know, we're in a generation, I think, that, um, you know, the celebrity mentality that's surrounding sort of the uh, Christian ministry culture, it's really toxic. And so what we have to do, and, and listen, I've got friends in full-time ministry that's their their paycheck and everything like that. And they're pure in heart. They have great hearts. They're pure in heart. They're amazing people. Uh, but I really believe going forward that we have to really believe, be, you know, there's a moment in Revelation where it talks about this big giant angel who has one foot in the sand, on, the, on the seashore and one foot in the sea. He's got one foot on dry land and one foot in the ocean. And I, that's kind of us right now. We've got to learn how to have one foot in culture, one foot in, in business and one foot in the kingdom. And so, uh, and that's the way we are. We're, we're, we're be, we're spiritual beings, but we're also physical beings and we're primarily physical beings. When God created man, he created him as in his image and he named him Adam, meaning literally red man from the, from the earth, from the clay, the red clay. And so we're physical beings. We got to be a part of this world, man. We got to right. be a part of this world. You got to be relatable, especially, you know, I have a 15 and a 13 year old son and we do a lot of youth group things in our backyard. Hashtag waiting for you to come speak to these boys and girls. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, no, but I got to be relatable to these kids. I can't be so spiritually minded that I'm no earthly good, as they say. Right. To where. Yes. Can people look at you and be like, dude, where is this guy coming from? But I'm glad we're here because you do live a lifestyle to where the outside looking in, I'm just going to say it. If people just saw like, okay, dude, he's a seer and supernatural lifestyle. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten this your whole life. It's like, well, what does that mean? Like you really can talk to God and you can see angels and look into the future. Like, what are you really saying? So let's start there. What is, how did, let me ask you this. What is a seer? Because you are a seer, correct? Yes. 
Yeah, that's a uh, it's a term that's used in First Samuel nine, uh, and it's actually what was uh, the original sort of label given to prophetic people. And so uh, Samuel was a seer before they were called prophets; they were called seers. So a seer is one who sees in visions and dreams. I'm a dreamer. I don't know if you dream, Matt, but I'm a dreamer, and I've dream I, I've had dreams my whole life, and uh, and the reality is that actually on average. Uh, every individual dreams about 26 dreams a night, but we only remember one, two, or even maybe one or two a year. I mean, honestly, some people have recurring dreams and they, you know, their whole night is a recurring dream, but there is something about dreams that really grabbed my attention. And I think in culture today, we are more fascinated by this stuff than ever before with the mm -hmm. movie Inception, you know, trying to really. Uh, contextualize what dreams look can look like, you know, in sort of this fantasy sci-fi action adventure, uh, you know, but in reality, dreams are a place of absolute honesty. We, we hear from God in that place. We, uh, we, we connect with the unseen and we see things, but not with these set of eyes. It's not like you're looking at a movie screen on your eyelids. You're seeing with another set of eyes, and that's the eyes of your imagination. That's the eyes of your heart. And that's what uh, Ephesians 1, it talks about the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your heart being enlightened. And so when, when we have the eyes of our heart are enlightened, we see from a different angle. And it's uh, Malcolm Gladwell created this amazing book called Blink. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but no. uh, Blink. Have you, have you read that book, Matt? I have not read that book. Dude, really, really good. So basically the hypothesis is that the, the split second reaction you have in your heart, your gut, your knower, that is a tell and it's a truth teller. And I, I really believe that he was giving sort of a, 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 sci a, a scientific approach, a study on what goes on in a seer. He, does, he doesn't use that language, but they studied a guy who actually could tell in a split second whether a painting was actually an authentic original or was a fake. And he had 100% accuracy. And so, uh, you know, did this, guy, this did this guy attribute it to God or did he attribute it to like his superpower or what did he attribute it to? Just this knower, just this instinct. And that instinct, that knower, that thing inside of you that says, I see this happening, or, or it's the it's a different set of eyes, and you have to you have to be sort of sensitive to it. And it's sort of like catching a fish, you know. I don't know if you like to fish, but Matt, I love to fish. Right. And but I hate going out with some guy that is awesome at fishing. Is there <laughs> you, it's like the worst experience, right? And but the truth is, each of us are getting the same amount of bites. One of us is sensitive. It ain't me. You know, I'm not sensitive to that touch. That guy does that every day or, or, you know, on, a, on, reg, on the regular and he's feeling that touch that he knows, but here's the interesting thing. It's not just the touch in his, the vibration in his hand. He knows in his gut what's going on beneath the water that he can't see with his natural eyes. What do we call that? It's a sixth sense for some people. It's a, it's an uh, other knowing. I believe that God created us with that other knowing, and it's the seer nature. It's the part of us that we can see the unseen. We can see uh, both the heavenly, the demonic, you know, the, the light, darkness, good, evil. It's happening all around us, and so, we have to learn. I want to ask you three things on that. A, where did you start? Like, when did this start in you? Uh, secondly, did you just say, okay, I'm a seer or like, did you say one day, like I'm a seer. And if that's different than a prophet, because I know you operate in both. And then lastly, how do you know you're the real deal? Like I, I want a story of, well, I know because this happened. Like, so when, for, first of all, when did it start for you to where you're like, whoa, this is the real deal. Like I have this, I am this and can everybody have it? Or is it just certain people? 
Yeah, no, I believe everybody can have it. And I, and I believe that if you are open and willing, God will speak to you. And so I, you know, for me, I, I didn't really recognize a label or title first. I, I just started having these dreams and I started testing them. And I would go and talk to people that I saw something about them in a dream. I remember one young lady I asked, I saw in a dream, she had blood coming from her. Uh, and, and it was, it was uh, actually in, you know, it, not, it was not good. It was not good. It was excessive. And, and so I, I, I said, look, I got a question for you. And Holy this is weird. Smokes. And we were on. So you see this dream, you have the guts to actually say this to this lady. I had a relational equity with her. And, and I feel like I, you kind of skipped over you, you. She had blood coming from her. Is it just something you don't want to get too much into? Like, let's just leave it, it at that. It, it was ir, 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 irritable bowel, but it was really, uh, it was really bad. So did and you was, sleep and have a dream of her, or are you looking at this person and you have a dream vision in your head as you're awake? No, I had a dream, a dream dream. And uh, I was gutsy. I had equity. I had relational equity. It wasn't like this yeah. is a stranger. Sure. And and I said, listen, I, I, I know this is weird. And I had some other folks uh, that, that trust her, she felt comfortable with, you know, and just one. And it was... It was something that I asked. I said, look, I could be completely off. I could be completely wrong. But is this something going on? And she's like, oh, my gosh, I've never told that to anybody. I've ne- I'm so embarrassed. But I-, I know God spoke to you. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. I've been praying. Please, God, touch me. Heal me. And we, and we got to pray. And it, was ama- it was an amazing moment. When those things happened and started happening more frequently, I started paying attention and I, and I, and I was sort of uh, hesitant at first, but after a while I started recognizing that there's something to this and, um, and more things happen that were, so, you I was know, gonna say, even- let me ask you this because I know our, our listeners are asking this. Why, if this girl has been praying to be healed, why would God need to give you a dream for you to pray for her so she could be healed? Why wasn't she just healed? Yeah. So God uses people. And the thing is, uh, why did God create man? If he could just manage the whole earth himself, God creates people. He cre- he uses people. He, he does things through other people. And, um, you know, God's not interested in being, you know, the, 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 you know, the quarterback and the wide receiver, he wants to do, he wants to have partnership. He, he, you know, he is all about partnership. And so if there's a willing vessel, now God can step out of, out of space time, into space time, out of the eternity and do it himself. But uh, if there's a willing vessel, someone who's willing to hear him and step out and be a fool like I am and, <laughs> and ask a, uh, an awful question like that in a very, I was shaky. I was nervous. Sure. And, and, um, you know, but then the fruit, you know, we get to pray and, and watch healing happen. And, and, um, and, you know, that's the, that's the stuff that we have to really contend for in our life. So I was going to say for that, that's such a deep, intimate healing and you're a male and she's a female. So when you say we got to watch healing happen, like, you know, literally does she come up to you the next day and it's like, Oh my gosh, today was the first day it didn't happen. Or was it over time? Like do you get an email like, Hey, I'm, I'm okay. Like, cause that's not something like you literally yeah. see or watch right away, obviously. So here's where social etiquette comes in. I'm not going to be the guy who is her all of a sudden healing accountability. I'm going to, she's got a, a girlfriend. She's got a friend in her life that is, is going to walk with her through that. Right. And, and so, you know, you got to use, listen, don't, don't be an idiot. Even, you, <laughs> you know, it's like, don't, I, I, I've seen this so often that people in the name of spirituality in the name of Christianity in the name of, uh, you know, Holy spirit, uh, act just so unhealthy in their, in their social etiquette, their social cues. Sure. There's some things that you just got to know and, and you got to have some street smarts about you. And, you know, that's one thing I like about you, Matt. You know, you're the real deal. But you can hang with those guys out on the street and talk their language and and, and love on them with the love of Jesus and be a real 
person it with them. And that's important. Guys, I just don't. Uh, there's a lot of people in our culture, Christian culture, that don't know how to do that. And it's really scary. It's really scary because uh, we act, you know, we, we act in a way uh, all, uh, embarrassingly in front of others. And we've got to handle ourselves with maturity. So here's the deal. I am, I keep my, I hold my cards close to my chest. If I'm experiencing something and I'm, I'm hearing something, I'm seeing something, I don't just blurt it out. I really process it with the Lord. I really process it with others. I don't share it with someone right away. I'm, 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 you know, I'm sort of testing the waters and here's what I look for. I'm always looking for an anchor moment in real life. Mm. So if there's, if there's something that I'm seeing in the spiritual world, I'm going to look for an anchor moment in real life. Is there any evidence that what I'm seeing in the spiritual is actually happening in the natural? Is there any evidence? If there's none, then I might not be seeing, or I might not be seeing something that is important to share or important to communicate. It might, it might be real, it might be happening, but it's not important for the time I'm living in. And so we have to learn how to judge what we're seeing and not just kind of jump the gun and, well, God spoke to me, you right. know, th- that's not acceptable. And so we have to really learn how to, how to test things, weigh things, you know, sc- the scriptures talk about the scales in the hands of the Lord. You know, when it talks about the scales, it's not talking about scales on a snake or scales on a, you know, it's talking about scales like a weighted vessel. You know, it's it's something that's weighted, measured. And when we weigh something and we we test it, we go, does this does this weigh the same amount as the word of God? Not not equal to God's word, but is it match God's word? Is it complementary to his word? Is it is it can you see it in the word? And so, you know, for me, is healing in the word? Yes. Is, uh, is blessing in the word? Yes. It, you know, is freedom from demonic oppression in the word? Yes. So like those things match what God's word says is possible. What, how about the flip side of that? Have you ever had a situation where you either, you know, were too afraid to speak up or you weren't sure that you were seeing, but you actually were, and you didn't take action and then there was a result that you didn't like, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I knew it. I should have dot, dot, dot. You know what I mean? And Oh, yeah, all the time. And, and this, here's one. I always see when I look, when I meet people, and I, I never, you know, I don't, haven't shaken their hands yet, but I see them from afar off, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I know I'm going to eventually talk to that person. It's in a room, you know, there's a bunch of people there, and I see it. I go, that guy, I know, I, I want to talk to that guy. That guy, there's something about him. I, I, I need to connect with him. I will get a name in my head, and, and it will remind me of somebody else. I'll be like, that person looks just like my buddy Chris. He he's just reminds me of Chris. And so I walk up, hey, man, what's up? I'm Jamie. He's like, hi, I'm Chris. I'm like, <laughs> you know, and so – now, that doesn't mean I miss God. That just means I'm paying attention. And right. so when I listen to that and I hear that, it's a clue. It's a clue for me. It's like little breadcrumb trails leading to the whole loaf. I'm going to find something from God that if I'm paying attention, those little mo- those little things that God slips into your mind and your imagination, and your heart, those are leading to something. And so you could go, Something on this. Now, I, you don't have to say, I don't interrupt that guy and go, God told me your name is Chris. Sure. I'm just going to be natural. I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I, I really believe that Jesus knew way more than he let on. And so, you know, when he's with his disciples, and, you know, I, there's a lot of things that are not told in the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the disciples that I believe Jesus kept to himself. He knew all those stuff. You know, mm-hmm. he knew what they were doing on the side, you know, the little arguments they were having. The, now, the real deals, quick, th- the, this is important, and I want to know what you believe on this. Yeah. Did Jesus know those things because he was God, or did Jesus know those things because he was a man filled with the Holy Spirit? 
Yeah, he was filled. He was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He was. I I believe that. You know, when we talk about Jesus, there's two different thoughts process that he's God, which is true, but then that that he emptied himself, which is uh, called kenosis, and in kenosis believes that Jesus emptied himself. You see this in different religions. Hinduism is all, you know, one of the things that they believe in is emptying yourself. And, 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 and so there's an emptying of self. Uh, Buddhism has some tendencies towards this, but the real, the real person is Jesus uh, that, that modeled this. He emptied himself. And it, it's not that he just, he, he was emptied and then he had an inability. He couldn't do anything in the name of God. He, he had an inability to disobey the father. And so he was unable to disobey the father. And so that was his inability. And so he emptied himself, became a man, became so reliant on the father. And I believe that the father clued him into a lot of things. But yet there are some things that Jesus did not know. Like? So, well, he says, you know, uh, my, they asked him about his return. He says, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the son. And the father knows. So the, the, Jesus' second coming, it was unknown to Jesus. And so, and that and we, we're, we think in our limited mind that in order to be God, you have to be all-knowing. Uh, and I don't think that that equates to being God. I think that God is all knowing, but God's not like out of his own control of knowing. He's not like, I can't help, but know. ah, you know, (laughs) right. (laughs) You know, it's like, he's not a victim to his all knowing. He is in charge of his knowing he is in command. And so he can say it's, he can give up like Jesus did to the father, the knowledge of his second coming. I don't, that's not for me to know. It's the father to decide. Sure. And the, uh, here's the thing. This is so important. The disciples saw something in Jesus that was so real, so different, that not only did they follow him, after he left them, they died for him because they saw, yeah. you know, they saw the supernatural. Like, I have a, uh, how do I word this? I want to say like a strong, not distaste, but it makes me sad Like religion makes me sad. Religion without power makes me sad because you're just reading another book. You're just going to another service. You're just walking another life that you can't really fulfill. And hopefully you get to heaven one day, brother, where all things are made right. And it kind of leaves you helpless down here. You're not one of those guys. Like you really do walk in supernatural power. And I believe that that's God's will for us because Jesus said to follow me. You don't ask someone to follow you and he says you'll do greater things than me you don't say that to someone unless it's possible and there's so many of us walking around that aren't experiencing that and we just think oh well it's it's god's will and you know well god just doesn't have that for me and he has certain gifts for it but that's not true they just it gives them an excuse to stay the same so my question to you is how do people tap into what you're saying because There's a lot of Christians in the world and there's a lot of powerless people that just have religion and no power. And what's happening, especially with our youth, is I'm just going to go there. You know, their phones, mom and dad, and what they're seeing here are trumping your old Bible stories without your experience. And so they're more fascinated with what's going on in the phone than they are hearing about how you and grandma and grandpa had a revival back in 1965. Like, yeah, because they're not experiencing it now. So how can people experience it to where it's attractive to their kids and their friends like it was attractive to the disciples so they'll truly follow, you know, the Holy Spirit, follow Jesus? Yeah, so here's here's what's what's real. We are men, humans, dependent upon God, God is the miracle worker. We're not the miracle worker. Jesus is the miracle worker. But when we say greater works, will we do? He says, greater works will you do? You know, he believes in me, the works I do, you will do also. And greater works that you may marvel. And, And this, 
you know, this idea, John 14, when Jesus talks about this, it's not that you're just going to go out and outperform Jesus. You're, you're going to go out and Christ is going to be in you. So Christ is in you. It's Christ in you. When, when Peter and John heal uh, the man at the gate called beautiful. Yeah. And when, when they, when the man gets up, he, they, you know, they, they go, who healed this man? They said, Why do you look at us as if our piety healed this man? (laughs) It's not us. It was Jesus. And then it says that the Pharisees and they discussed, it says they perceived that these men had been with Jesus. That's the thing. Have you been with Jesus? Right. And if you have, you're going to see things happen that are going to be out, out, you know, out of the norm. And it's, it's a willing, you being willing and, you know, here's the thing I get, I've taken a lot of people overseas, uh, literally thousands of people overseas and we've gone overseas and ministered and, you know, the average American guy or gal who is conservative down, you know, level-headed, low key will be willing to do something outrageous overseas because they're stepping outside of their bubble they're stepping outside of their norm they go to africa and some guy comes up and he has death threatening malaria they're going to pray and see that man healed whereas here in the states we go you ain't go to a doctor just get them get fixed up you know so true and and so why is that well i think that we're more willing to risk and look like a fool in places that you know we are outside of our comfort zone and so that's why I always am putting myself in a place outside of my comfort zone. I'm always intentional about that. And so let me give you an example, a, a story. This is one of those that I really enjoy. I love. Um, I was down in Texas ministering at this church and the power of God was just present. There It was just a beautiful thing. The worship was just amazing. Yeah. You know, people in Texas just worship bigger. It's just, <laughs> it's awesome. And so. I see, I'm, I'm starting to pray for people. And I see this one young lady, she was probably in her, in her 60s. And, and, I, and I, when I look at her, I, I can see, I'm like drawn to her in, in her mouth. And I'm like, something is with her mouth. God wants to touch her mouth. What's, what's up with that? Now, the way it looks to me is like a caricature. You ever seen a caricature at, you know, Six Flags or, you know, they, what do they do? They overemphasize your nose. Or if you have big ears, they make them like Dumbo, right? Mm -hmm. So when I look at someone and I know God wants to heal their body, something on their body will be like unusual, stand out. It'll stand out to me. So you're looking at this lady and then in your spiritual eyes, she has like a caricatured mouth. Something's going on in her mouth. You don't know what it is. Something is there. And so in front of everybody, I said, what's up with your mouth? There's a miracle <laughs> in your mouth. That's so, you know, what's up with your mouth? Like, she's like, what? But dude, that's so awesome that you have the guts to do that. Cause that's when God shows up. So what yeah. happened? And I said, look, I'm, I'm just going to put this out there. What's up with your mouth? There's some, God wants it. She goes, I don't know. And I go, well, God wants to do something. There's a miracle in your mouth. I don't understand it, but. I'm just going to speak a miracle. And she goes, well, I, she goes, I'm, I'm missing my tongue. Oh, geez. And I go, what? And she, and, and, and I said, and I don't have time to like really interview. I just go, Lord, heal her in Jesus name. I felt the faith. And I said, heal her in Jesus name. And she goes down under the power of the spirit. And uh, I make this declaration. That's important guys that you do this in your life, whether it's over your family, whether it's over your business, whether it's over your health, you make a declaration. Today, I'm going to be better. Today, I'm going to feel well. Today, I'm I'm healed in Jesus name. Today is a day. I'm I'm going to watch the joy of the Lord touch every person I come in contact with. Those are declarations that I make. Those are declarations anyone should make. And so uh, I remember 
I make this declaration and I say to her, I say, um, watch tomorrow. She'll wake up healed. And I feel like a, um, like a pressure, like a discipline, almost like I need to say this out loud. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I get a phone call from the pastor the next day because I left, I left in the morning, uh, the next day, very early. And the pastor calls me and she says, Jamie, you're not going to believe it. But that lady, half of her, I, he goes, she says, I've known her for 20 years and I've literally known her. She's been a very close person, a, a friend of mine in, in my life. And she had cancer, something like 18 years ago, or, and half of her tongue had to get cut out because it was a tongue cancer of some kind. And so she says, she woke up this morning and her mouth was buzzing and her tongue was completely whole. Come on. Like she grew a tongue? Her tongue grew overnight. And, and she, that was, it was absolutely amazing. And, and the whole place, you know, Wow. Now you, you go, you hear a story like that. You go, well, why wasn't the news there to watch that? Why? Right. Wasn't the, you know, yeah, that's where your was, mind goes. Yeah. I mean, look, the news ignores truth on, on a lot of levels, you know? And so their, their business is not to go is not, is not to make God famous, you know? And so anything that makes God famous, that's, that's not really the news's job. They, you know, uh, they say this in, I was going to say, here's why it's so easy for me to believe that story is my mom battled cancer for years. Uh, she was diagnosed in 1998 with inflammatory stage four breast cancer. They gave her, I, I don't remember, like three or six months to live in 1998. Long story short, she's still alive. Uh, the, the speaker is still alive to this day. Martha Tennyson, love her to death. She came through our church, Covina Assembly of God, ministered that night, praise on my mom. Now, I was the baby of five, so my mom, you know, let me in on a little bit more than other people saw. I, I was the guy that shaved my mom's head. My mom had a devil vasectomy, so there was nothing there on her chest, except she was just riddled with tumors, and she had gauze all around her chest. Like, it was, it was horrible. Like, the, the worst you can imagine from the vision, the smell, all that stuff. But she, you know, I was, I lived in my parents' house at that time when I was going through my football stuff in junior college. Anyway, here's my point. Martha Tennyson comes through that night. My mom is kind of on her last leg. The doctors say, you know, she's, you know, three months, whatever it was, riddled with tumors on her chest. She goes up for prayer. You know, I don't know how she did it because she was very, very sick. Martha Tennyson lays hands on her and prays on her. So similar to what you just said. She looks at her and makes a declaration over my mom in front of hundreds of people. And she says, look in the mirror tomorrow and expect a change. Wow. Because something's going to happen. Dude. Yeah. I wake up the next morning and I didn't think of it. I was whatever, you know, 17, 18 at the time. Like, I don't know when you're young, those things don't really resonate with you unless you're really in tune. Didn't really resonate with me. I just remember waking up the next morning to my mom screaming, Matthew, come here, come in here. My mom's got her shirt off and she's taking a Q-tip and she's scraping her chest and tumors are falling off her body onto oh the freaking goodness. ground and it's new baby skin underneath. By the time she was done, the whole process took like 20 minutes. She's basically scraping her chest with a two, with a uh, Q-tip. And by the time she was done, she had a new chest. Now, boobs weren't there, but it was a new skin. Right. And I was just in shock. And she goes to the doctor the next day, and she has before and after pictures and all that, and it was a, a complete miracle. And that's back in 1998, 99. And, and my mom ended up living another five, six years saw four or five grandkids born, saw me on American Idol, saw me win a Rose Bowl, met my future wife, all that stuff. Like her life was extended, supernatural miracle. That's why it's easy for me to believe a story like that because I've seen it with my own eyes. So people who are intrigued right now that are listening like, well, that's great for you, Jamie. That's great for you, Matt. But I've never seen anything like that. 
how can they see that? Because I know we're crunched for time. We only have about six minutes left. How could people tap into that and see that and really get the proof of themselves? Because I know God wants to show them. It's not yeah. like he's withholding it from them. Well, here's the deal. You got to stay childlike. And that, that means not childish, but childlike. And it means that you're going to continue to believe God, even when you're, you've been disappointed, even when it didn't work out, even when, you know, my goodness, your mother facing that illness and it's, it's just ravaging her body. It's terrible, absolutely terrible. But she kept believing. Why? How do I know that? She's in the right place. She's not running from God. She's in the house of God. And, you know, it's to stay childlike. God, I'm seeking you. Uh, you know, I have a very similar story to that, Matt. My mother had very serious terminal cancer, breast cancer. She was, uh, you know, had a mastectomy and that was gone and th that was taken care of and it, lots of uh, chemo and all that stuff. But then about a year later, year and a half later, she had brain cancer appear out of nowhere. And it was just, it was absolutely terrible. Just destroyed her body. You know, Bell's palsy, half of her body's limp. It's just, it was ter absolutely terrible. We kept believing God for her to be healed. And I remember she would ask me to take her to church. I'd, I'd, run, I'd go to church and take her to church. And she'd wake me up in the middle of the night and say, can you pray for me? And we'd pray. And Jeez. it was amazing. It was amazing. So all this time, she's dreaming about going and be with Jesus. And I said, no, mom, you're not going to be with Jesus. You're going to be here with me. And Jesus is going to be here with us. Okay. We're going to do this together. Right. Jesus door. And so she's like, I know, but I want to be healed, but I also want to be with Jesus. And so I have a dream and it's like a dream vision in the dream. I saw that she was healed and I was, Oh my goodness. The cancer is gone. Right. It's gone in the dream. You know, it's like, it's a, a completely gone. And I was in the dream rejoicing with her. But in the dream vision, she also had something wrong with her right leg. It was like something was wrong. And, and she was walking with a limp, and there was something wrong in her leg. And so I woke up from the dream, and I was very troubled. And I told her this dream. I said, Mom, I saw a dream. You were healed. It was amazing. And she's like, oh, my goodness, yes. And I said, but there was something very weird about this. You also had something in your right leg, and I don't know what that is, but in this dream, you were, you were walking with a limp, and it was something with your leg, and I can't understand it, but it, you were healed, and I was so excited. Well, long story short, about a week later, um, she was it, actually uh, died in the hospital. They brought her back to life, you know, uh, and it, it, was, it was real. They actually, boom, clear brought her back to life. Um, and it was like a split second thing, you know, just real quick. And she was in the critical care. They're thinking she's going to die. And so one of my friends comes, prays for her. My goodness, she gets healed. And she wakes up. The doctors say, you had a medical miracle. We cannot understand this. But the brain, the cancer in your brain is completely gone. There's not an ounce of cancer detectable in your body. And so they were like, we don't understand this. So they let her go. They dismissed her. She was released from the hospital. And um, three days later, I remember she was walking around. She was so excited. She was rejoicing. And I heard a scream from the, the I was upstairs, second, second floor of the house. And she was downstairs doing some some stuff in the laundry, and I heard her scream, "Help!" and all, and ah! and so I ran down, and I found her, and she was convulsing, and she was, she was, uh, she was, she was flailing, and I, I was holding her in my arms, and I, Matt, I was going, "In the name of Jesus, I speak healing over you, Lord." I just would, you know, I didn't know what to pray. I was just praying every prayer, and the the the, the ER. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the e EMS, they came, the, they, they, got, uh, they got her, they took her, and on her way to the hospital, she went on to be with the Lord. And it was, a, it was, a, it was like so suddenly, it was, what? And so uh, they, I, I was kind of baffled by the whole thing. I didn't know what to think. 
And so they came back with the autopsy and they said, well, it wasn't cancer. It was a blood clot in her leg. And uh, this blood clot traveled from her leg to her lung. And that was what was what, what took her out. And, um, and so what is the takeaway? I, I've had to, I have had to face that, that that has been a thing that's loomed up, you know, like, oh, it's, it's in some ways it can be used as an accusation against God. For sure. That's the first thing that was in my mind. Please keep going. Yeah. But I can't go there in my head because if I do, it's just a never ending dark road where everything becomes an accusation against God. But what I do know is God is good and God is right. And when I look at him and I go, God, I don't understand your ways, but I trust you. And I'm going to continue to contend for healing no matter what. I'm going to continue to contend for people to be whole. And since then, Matt, I've seen so many people heal with cancer. And that, that it, because it literally, it, I hate cancer. I hate it. But more, more real than that, I hate death. I hate death. And death is one of those things that like, literally, when I hear somebody has died, I, I like get pissed off. Why? Because that's the last enemy to be destroyed. Jesus will completely destroy death. There will be the death of death, no dying anymore. And we're here for that. We're here to right. see that. That's our goal. And I, I've been blessed to be a part of seeing a resurrection from the dead and seeing something like that really happen. That's the stuff that we, we've got to continue to be childlike and contend for, even in the midst of a disappointing world where things are happening and people are getting taken out and sickness and people dying from COVID, people recovering from COVID. doesn't matter. We need to contend for healing and just believe God. And this is what that's all about, man. Can I ask you, because it's 942, do I have to let you go right right now? Can I ask you? Yeah, I've got to go in a minute, but go ahead. Okay. So I got to be honest about that story. Uh, it, like you said, an accusation against God. Like my question is, why would he show you that only for that to happen? Because I'm sure you're not going to get to heaven one day and God's going to look at you and be like, see, I told you so. You should have no. prayed for the leg or something like that. Like, what was the point of all that to show you that? Sometimes it is to change the destiny of someone. Sometimes it is to pray for them that they, they may be healed. Other times it's to prepare our hearts. My heart was so in it. And I, and I received that as an assurance that God is writing my story. God is writing my story. And he knows all these things that are going to happen. He didn't make her die. It's not that. He didn't make her have a blood clot. That's not what he's, he did. God doesn't. Look, I tell people, if God sent you cancer, stop taking your medicine and really receive, you know, get the lesson. God didn't right. send cancer. God doesn't. He's not sending that sickness. It's the enemy. But God knows. And he says, I want to give you insight into this so that when it happens, you're not caught off guard in your faith. What did Jesus say to Peter? He says, the enemy has prayed that he may sift you like wheat. But I pray that when you return, you restore your brothers. Uh, Jesus saw that he was going to go through a time of betrayal, denial. He was going to literally deny Christ three times. But he says, but there's another story. And when you return, you're going to restore your brothers. And so this is something that we're here for. We, it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. And that, and that story with my mother, it's not the end of her story either. There's a moment, man, we're going to be reunited with all of our loved ones, man. And that's not a fantasy. It's the reality and it's the hope of the gospel. And so, you know, we get to see everyone that we've touched in life and, and impacted. And that's what we're here for. That's what, that's what the good news is. That's what the good news is. And it's not some pie in the sky, ethereal thing. It's real. And I have that assurance. I have so that the, assurance. And the, up, I the upshot, I was going to say the upshot of that story for you that God showed you that is what? Is for me. Yeah. It, the, it's 
Well, there's several things. I was going to say, one, because, it, because it happened, like he gave you that dream, your mom did get miraculously healed of cancer, and there was something wrong with her leg, and it was fatal. So yeah. I'm trying to ask you, like, so what's the upshot? Why did God show you that? Like, what was the point? Because it happened. God lets you have... God lets you hear secrets if you're willing to le- hear and be humble and not be, uh, you know, bitter. He will let you hear secrets. Most, some of us, we hear God, but we only hear out of the lens we're allowing him to speak. Mm-hmm. So can we handle honest conversation with God? And God goes, look, here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I want you to know this. You're, there's something that's going to happen to your mom. And that, that to me was assuring that God knows my future. He knows my destiny. And, you know, God doesn't, he's not a genie in a bottle where he just tells you all good things. He, you know, he, and makes your wishes come true. He, he tells you things in advance so that you can prepare your heart for that. And that is a heart quality that you have to have as someone who hears God, because you're going to hear things that are hard to hear. You're going to have to do you process think, things. Do you think you and, could have, do you think you could have or should have prayed against that? So that didn't happen. Do you think there was a way to have a different outcome or do you think it was already set and it was done? Yeah. I don't go there. You don't, don't go there. Go Cause there. why? I don't go there in my head because honestly that, that, that is a land of disappointment that I could have done this. And it really says that I'm powerful. I'm the powerful one. I We're all, being humbled by God. And that's what's real, man. I mean, when you look at life, man, life is not in our control. Control is an illusion. You know, we, it's true. It's it, totally it's an true. illusion, man. One control day you're here and one day you're not. And God says to that man that laid up riches in his big, you know, uh, silo, he says, your grain side, he goes, I, I, the guy says, I lived a good life. I, now rest, let's retire. And God says, fool, your soul is required of you this night. And your life is like a vapor, man. But that's why we are here. We're, we're here in the split second that we have on earth, the microsecond we have in history to actually bring impact, make a change, do as much kingdom as we can here while we're here and, and lay up an inheritance for generations, lay up a legacy for generations. And so for me, the takeaway, God's writing my story. I'm not a fatalist. I don't believe in fate. I believe in destiny. I believe Jesus is writing my story. I have, and it's a beautiful story. It's a brilliant story. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's heartache. There's sadness. There's miracles. There's victory. It's like a recipe. You don't throw together a recipe for a cake with all sweet ingredients. Some of them are sour. Sometimes that's what life is like. There's certain elements of your life that are going to have sour ingredients, but together the whole, they make up something really special. And so God so wants awesome. to bring us to a place where we can that handle great, that. That was such a great analogy. Dude, listen to this, you know, all these for, people, hey, for the, hey, for the record, for the record, you're the one that's keep going, not me, but go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. All good. <laughs> I'm just waiting for my, 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 my appointment is I'm waiting for the guys to go. Now's the time we got to go. So good. I'm praying against uh, that. Keep going. (laughs) Your prayers are working. So, uh, they're, they're delayed. They're on another zoom call. No, just kidding. Uh, so, (laughs) so, you know, here's, here's, here's the thing. When Trump did not win Mm -hmm. and all these people are like betting on that. And that is their, 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 like their, it's the only hand they played and it's all their eggs in that basket okay and you're talking about people or you're talking about christians sorry bad joke keep going what's that (laughs) i said were you talking about people or were you talking about christians sorry bad joke keep going yeah yeah (laughs) well you know here's the deal it it it, and, and and i believe in voting for righteousness and 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 you know my out of my conscience and so that's, 100%. that's what I, that's what I do. That's where I live. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against that. I am totally for that. We got to create change in this world. And, uh, you know, the, there's things that are real that are happening and that are just, it's just demonic. And so here's the deal though. When people, people couldn't hear 
that he was going he was not going to be president. They just couldn't hear it. Right. And so now today there are people that that literally months after he's not president still are in denial and still pr- pretending that there's going to be some kind of like mid-August thing. Uh-uh. <laughs> and and listen, I want to tell you four, 5 years ago when he was going to be president, there are people who couldn't hear it then. Right. They couldn't hear it. And so can we actually hear, uh, I have a friend finish on this. I have a friend, he collects dreams. He's got a, a website database. He collects dreams. He's collected 54,000 dreams and they're being studied by MIT. People from all over the world have literally logged in their dreams and time stamped them, uh, locate geo stamped them. It's an amazing thing. Uh, and so, and he has dreams from people from all walks of life. Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, all these people, right? They just, they all timestamp, they log their dreams, and it's a thing that he's doing as a research project. Well, when he got those 54,000 dreams, he analyzed them, and they did word searches, all that type of stuff. Something like 60-something dreams or 50-something dreams were, were shared that Trump would become president of the United States in 2016. So they, they are all logging these dreams and, and telling, and there was people like literally sharing these dreams and they'd be like, I, I hate this. I would, I hope it doesn't happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, but on the other side, Hillary Clinton was also running at that time. Zero dreams were submitted that she was going to win the presidency. Zero. That's crazy. Now, what does that tell you? Dreams are one of the most honest places where God will bypass your your sort of uh, your your ideas of life, what should and shouldn't happen, and it's a place where we we're, when you go to sleep, you you can't keep all of your inhibition. You're you're sleep. You're right. you're like you're at the will and the mercy of God, right? And so, uh, and that's why Scripture says God watches over you when you sleep. You slumber. God watches over you. He keeps you. He protects you. Now, those dreams all shared uh, an honest reality, a window to the future, that that time Trump was going to be president, right? And, and why, why we sort of um, think that God is not in this writing a story that is sort of bigger than we understand. He's playing 4D chess. He's not playing... The chess, what we think, it's not just one moving forward, moving forward. He's moving sideways, backwards. Uh, you know, uh, he, he's moving all sorts of different directions because he's ultimately writing a story where he wins and those who with are with him will be on his side and we get to see the victory. And that's, that's the finisher, man. Jesus is alive and he is going to see great victory in our lives. This is that day. And so, Matt, can I pray for people? Can I, can I do that? Is that cool? Absolutely. And people would want you to pray for them. Yeah. So, Lord, right now, Matthew and I, we just pray for power to be released in the, in the name of Jesus, that people would begin to experience your goodness. People would begin to experience your grace, Lord, and that they would have a victory in their life, no matter the disappointment. And we're willing to hear you when it's hard to hear you, but we see the silver lining. We see the goodness of God, what you're going to do, what you're going to prepare. Lord, I ask you to do this. Give them insight. Give them the ability to see. Give them the ability to dream. Let them have that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Dude, we got to do this again. I have so many more questions to ask you. I mean, you, you've you written books. One of your books, The Superna- uh, Supernatural Revolution, Hearing God's Voice, Secrets to the Seer. You have a book coming out next year called Secrets of the Angels, Keys to Working with Heaven's Messengers. Yes. Like, there's so much there and so much to talk about. We um, can do that one, man, in the future. What's one thing I always ask people, what's one thing that you can leave our listeners like the level up moment, whether it's a quote, whether it's 
uh, a comment, uh, anything that you would share with them before we let you go to help them level up? This is something that I live by. This is what the Lord gave me years ago. Live hungry, feed others. Live hungry, feed others. Live hungry, guys. Don't stop. Feed others. You know, you're here for that. That's what you're here for. You're a good man. I love you, brother. Thank you so much for coming you, on buddy. today. And uh, thank you for tuning in and for listening. As always, we ask you to please like, subscribe, and share. Leave a rating, preferably a five-star rating. Today was deep. Today was interesting. And today, I know, helped you in one way or another level up. So thank you so much for joining us. Like, subscribe, share, and keep this thing going, baby. And this has been another week of Level Up.